today I'm going to interview Dr. Murray Stein and Dr. Thomas Arst on their joint project as editors of Jung's Red Book for Our Time, Searching for Soul Under Postmodern Conditions. Today I'm going to be reading from volume three, but Dr. Stein and Dr. Arst also did volumes one and two, which are here over my shoulder. Murray Stein, PhD, studied at Yale University, BA in English, and attended graduate school at Yale Divinity School, Master in Divinity, and the University of Chicago, PhD in Religion and Psychological Studies. He trained as a Jungian psychoanalyst at the C.G. Jung Institute of Zurich from 1976 to 2003, he was a training analyst at the C.G. Jung Institute in Chicago, of which he was a founding member and president from 1980 to 1985. In 1989, he joined the executive committee of the International Association of Analytical Psychology as honorary secretary for Dr. Thomas Kirsch, 1989 to 1995, and served as a president of the IAAP from 2001 to 2004. He was president of ISAP Zurich 2008 to 2012, and is currently a training and supervising analyst there. He resides in Thun, Switzerland. His special interests are psychotherapy and spirituality, methods of Jungian psychoanalytic treatment, and the individuation process. Dr. Thomas Aris, PhD, was educated in physics and mathematics at Gießen University, Germany, research assistant at Princeton University, with a special focus on atomic, nuclear, and plasma physics, 1988 training and certification in initiatic therapy at the Durkheim Center. Since 1999, President and Managing Director of Strategic Advisors for Transformation GmbH at International Consulting Company for Simulation Technology, Complexity Management, and Strategic Foresight under Deep Uncertainty in Freiburg, Germany. Dr. Arst resides in Lenskirch, Black Forest, Germany. Thomas, I wonder if you would expand on that a little bit and tell us something about the Durkheim Center, too. Yes, the Durkheim Center is a retreat center here in the Black Forest that was established in the 50s by a rather famous Zen teacher, Karlfried Graf Durkheim, and his wife, who was my personal mentor when I came to Durkheim, um, after entering my personal individuation process. So the, the Durkheim Center is um, based on Zen tradition on one side and Jungian psychology on the other side. It's, it's a hidden away, maybe like Big Sur in California, in the middle of the mountains. Murray was there two years ago, right? That's right, yeah. It's a place where people go if they come into a spiritual crisis where they find therapeutical uh, help from, from Zen itself to dream analysis and other uh, methods uh, uh, analytical psychology provides. So I work there since 30 years now and um, <clears throat> I run symposia workshops on Jung uh, on the Red Book, too. I think it's the only place in Germany that people can come if they have questions about their life. Maybe they are in a crisis and they get helped with, uh, let's say, all that analytical psychology can provide. I see. Very interesting. Murray, I wonder if you would uh, tell me something about how you and Dr. Ars got together on this project, which has become quite a dramatic project at this point with three volumes already. I'd be glad to do that, uh, Skip. Um, I teach at um, what we call ISEP Zurich, uh, which is a training program for Jungian analysts in Zurich, Switzerland. 
And uh, Thomas um, came there for um, a course of study in what we call the certificate program. So he spent a year studying in our school, and that's where I met him. And uh, one day he invited me to lunch. He said he had a, an idea that maybe we would discuss and um, I might find interesting. So I thought, why not? So Thomas and I had a lunch, and uh, at that lunch he he uh, suggested that we collaborate on putting together a series of essays. Uh, we were thinking of one volume at that time on uh, the Red Book, which had been published in 2009. This was about 2016, 17, wasn't it, Thomas, when we had this first lunch? And my first reaction uh, to his suggestion was a bit skeptical because I thought so much had already been written about the Red Book. There had been symposia and conferences and discussions. So I was um, not so sure that there would be enough interest um, among uh, Jungian scholars and analysts to contribute to something like that. But as we talked and um, he put forward his idea of, um, you know, asking for essays that were not just um, kind of, of historical interest, the Red Book is a historical object, a history of analytic, in the history of analytical psychology or Jung's personal development, but to take the book and look at it from the perspective of our time, which we call postmodernity. I mean, it's not something that we've <laughs> uh, invented. It's a, it's a term that describes our age, uh, uh, beginning in about 1980 onwards, we're living in an era called postmodernity. That we look at the Red Book as having a as having something to say to this era of cultural history in the West, but also throughout the whole world. And that intrigued me uh, to use the Red Book as a a resource to think about the problems that we face today. Does it have anything to say to us? It's kind of a hermeneutical project where you take a document from the past and you apply uh, apply it to the present. You look for lessons, you look for guidelines or, or um, uh, re reference points or something that can help you in your present uh, and current situation. So that idea intrigued me. So um, I know a lot of Jungian analysts, as you said, I've uh, when you introduced me, I've had a lot of experience in the Jungian community worldwide for a long time, so I, I knew quite a few people, authors and scholars. So uh, Thomas and I constructed a letter in which we described the project, um, what the mission of the project would be, and um, sent out um, about 20 um, letters. And the response was overwhelmingly positive. I was surprised that people would have, take such an interest. So. Uh, from that we, uh, response, we decided, well, let's, why stop with one uh, collection? Let's see if we can round up some more people to contribute. And um, so uh, we wrote out other, sent out other letters to um, names of people that I knew and, and, that, and Thomas knew and who had, had uh, taken an interest in the Red Book and who were, had something to say about our times. So in the end, we've gotten about 60 or 70 uh, people to contribute. We've now published three volumes. We're uh, collecting the essays, 18 essays for the fourth volume, and we're already, we've got lined up people for a fifth volume. So we're now <laughs> beginning to work on volumes four and five of this series. To me, it's, it was astonishing how much interest there was in this project on the part of the authors, but also on the part of readers uh, like yourself, Skip, who have taken an interest in this series and the books have sold quite well and um, we've gotten a good response from readers. I was also very much in contact with Chiron Publications, our publisher. I had originally owned that company with, uh, with my uh, friend and colleague, Nathan Schwartz Lunt. We sold the company about uh, 10 years ago to Steve Buser and, um, um, and, the, uh, and um, Len Cruz, two psychiatrists who live in Asheville, North Carolina. And they've done a great job in, in uh, expanding the purview and the, and the vision of the company. They've published a lot of books in the meantime, and they were very excited to 
take up this project and uh, we've been working with them very happily and they will continue to publish these theories as we can manage to put them together and edit them. So that's what you have uh, behind you and on your desk, uh, the three volumes we've read. Right. Uh, okay. So we'll just uh, show this is the third volume that I'm working with today, Jung's Red Book for Our Time, Searching for Soul Under Postmodern Conditions, edited by Murray Stein and Thomas Arst, uh, volume three. Skip, I might add a little history. What happened prior to the meeting Murray just mentioned, uh, when the Red Book came out in 2009 and I had it in my hands, I was amazed and immediately felt that there's something very specific and valuable with this, with this opus. Um, I could not really specify it. And even after 10 years, I'm still amazed when I read it. So it, it is kind of an ocean without a shore, <laughs> to take a quote of uh, Ibn Arabi. So what I then did in the Durkheim Center, I initiated works, workshops where we would do readings on the Red Book. We read certain chapters. And <clears throat> during that weekend, we would conduct um, active imaginations after the reading and it showed that people really got into some soul searching process initiated by the readings. And that was very interesting. It did something to the people who came into the Durkheim Center and um, then I had this idea, we need to, let's say, spread the word how can we do that to show it to the level of the layman outside of a retreat center? And that was the reason why then I approached Murray and said, how can we, you know, take this monumental work um, and bring it more to the public? And even today, I mean, we, we've done our work. It, it went on. Next year, we're going to have a, a big conference on it. And, but I still miss more, let's say, more publicity in the media or on TV or in, as a movie. That's something I feel still needs to be done. Yes, I agree. And just uh, to give both of you a sense of where I'm coming from, uh, I had a confrontation with the unconscious in 1993, and I was seized by it but for eight months. And because I'm not a psychiatrist or psychologist, I had no idea what was going on. Although I had experience with Jungian psychology, and I had just read Clarissa Pinkola Estes's book, Women Who Run With the Wolves. And apparently that too initiated these sorts of things within me, which I didn't know at the time. And that manifested as a novel that I ended up writing, but then put in my drawer for 21 years because it contained shadow elements, which I didn't recognize until I did a lot more study. But in 2009, when Dr. Jung's Red Book was published, I recognized my experience in his experience. And so, Actually, long before that, I have been working with Jungian psychology, but uh, in 2010, I started a website called archetypeinaction.com, and I've published over 3,500 essays on that site. Then, I, three years ago, I spontaneously started this meetup group to talk about Dr. Jung's work, and I started to video record it. And that has resulted in, as of today, 983 videos online. So it became quite a project. So in terms of your project, though, um, when I first received Volume 1, I was profoundly moved by Thomas's essay, which is the first essay in the series. And it, um, I just found it profoundly moving. And that's in volume one. 
and I read it online, and I subsequently obtained permission from you gentlemen and from Chiron uh, to read a percentage of the essays from these books into the YouTube channel, and I appreciate that very much. Now, in the process of that today, or in the last two, three weeks, I've had, the, I've had volume three, and I've read a, a number of the essays, I've read four of the major essays into the channel, and they raised a question for me that concerned me. And one was an article by Dr. Steven Eisenstadt, which is the last essay in the series so far. And what Dr. Eisenstadt seemed to be doing to me was to just give laymen, anybody that can pick up this book and read it, uh, a green light to go into active imagination. And I was immediately thinking back of my experience in 1993 and how I was uh, completely dislocated, <laughs> discombobulated by the experience. And I read also uh, Dr. Toshio Kawai's essay. He's the incoming president of the IAAP. And Dr. Kawai said that Dr. Young wasn't in a psychotic episode because his ego was strong enough to handle the experiences that he was having in these uh, five years of active imagination that he was doing. And so I'd like to ask both of you to comment on uh, uses and abuses of active imagination, which is what the Red Book actually is, and how laymen should warn, you know, how laymen should take a caveat emptor and beware of how they enter into the space. So either one of you, please. Murray? Well, you know, there are laymen and there are laymen and laywomen. Uh, so people are very different. Um, I've taught active imagination to groups of people over the years, <clears throat> small groups, usually maybe eight or 10 people. And in that time, I've had a, only one questionable experience on the part of a, of a person, a, a woman who for the first time was crying active imagination. She became very emotional and distraught. And um, we had to spend a little time with her to you know, kind of get her back into her normal ego state. But for most people, it is, it's a fairly safe thing to do because we have our natural defenses against the unconscious. A lot of people find active ma imagination extremely difficult to do. They have to really work at it. It's like meditating. You know, you have to focus your mind, you have to wait, you have to be patient, nothing happens for a long time. Then finally something moves a little bit and you track that. And I say that it's basically three rules to, to do active imagination. If you follow these rules, it will, it will work for you. Um, um, the first one is uh, uh, whatever comes, um, receive it. Uh, the second one is if it moves, follow it. Uh, and the third is uh, pay attention to what's happening and try to engage with what, what is there. So active imagination is different from passive fantasy in that the ego is actively engaged and involved in the process, in, a, in an exploration, in a dialogue, in, a, in, a, in an activity with imaginal figures. So for most people, I would say it's not dangerous to try to do it. But uh, one always has to be um, uh, cautious with uh, certain types of personalities that are either A, extremely open and sensitive to the unconscious to begin with, and so uh, just opening the door a bit can, more than it usually is can kind of overwhelm them temporarily at least. Or um, people who are, you know, really mentally ill. It's not, it's not advisable for, you know, schizophrenics uh, mm -hmm. to uh, try to do active imagination. So we're trained as Jungian analysts to be 
rather careful with using it in the analytic context, uh, depending on who we're working with. Um, but it's it's a lot like imagination, uh, like uh, meditation. You, it takes a while. You need to train yourself to do it. I, I when I teach people to do it, and I suggest they do it with a time limit. They only spend um, thirty or forty minutes um, per day uh, doing active imagination. They write down exactly what they've experienced. Next day, they start with where they stopped the day before and continue, but put a, a, a time limit on it. So that keeps the ego in control, um, and you aren't swept away and carried away and into a um, excessive uh, engagement with the unconscious. The other thing is, you know, people will have experiences like yours, uh, Skip. Thomas had this experience before they've uh, without any encouragement. They aren't trying to do active imagination. It sort of comes upon them. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's not a, a break. It's not a schizophrenic, you know, episode or a psychotic episode, but it's just a very strong um, uh, 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 imaginative activity that sets in and can be rather disruptive uh, and frightening. Um, the best thing you can do I think when that happens to you is go to a, a Jungian analyst or somebody who knows what, something about this and how to manage it and how to use it because it can be of great benefit to you. You're, you're, you're being opened up to a treasure field to, to <laughs> something magnificent uh, and uh, it will be the greatest thing that ever happened to you if you uh, can um, make use of it. Uh, some people just cover it up and forget about it and hope it doesn't happen to them again. And they've lost a great uh, experience and a great resource. It can transform you. I'm sure it did a lot for you, Skip. And no doubt about it. No doubt about it. And Dr. Young has been my therapist for 32 years. So, Great guy. A great helper. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thomas, what, what comments do you have? Well, thanks for raising the question. Um, whoever has the joy and the burden of entering his own individuation process knows that it is a pretty or can be a pretty rough ride. Um, and it takes an immense amount of strength to go through what I would call the, let's say, encounter with the numinos or meet the divine fire. I think, and that's basically the way how Murray and me started out, in the times we live in, let's say, the mess and the chaos of the postmodern world, our idea and message was it's the only thing or the only process that can help each individual through these chaotic times we live in. That's why we basically came up with the message that we took from Jung naturally, create your own red book. So that's one side of it. Since it's a dance on the razor's edge, you have to be careful. You need help, you need guidance. Um, or whatever means are available. But in some, there's no way, that's my personal view, to get around it if you want to, let's say, <clears throat> somehow, in a sane sense, survive our times today and what is to come in the coming years where I think I'm not very optimistic. Hmm. I'm very optimistic, <laughs> but okay. So um, my question in part then would be, are people who tend to be very intuitive on the Myers-Briggs scale of sensing and intuitive, more likely to be people who are drawn to this and more likely to be the people that will enter an act of imagination very quickly and relatively easily and 
what should I be concerned about in terms of presenting material, which I'm intentionally pretend or I'm intentionally presenting a YouTube channel that I think I'm aiming at laymen in general on the theory that most people, including me, can't afford $150 an hour or whatever the going rate is to go talk to a Jungian analyst. And so therefore, a lot of people who don't have the funds or the ability to go see a Jungian analyst need some sort of guidance for, um, for laymen. Your thoughts on that? Well, you know, um, a lot of the Jung Institutes provide programs for lay people um, in the form of lectures, discussion groups, workshops. So you can make, uh, if you have one of those in your area, you, you can join that, uh, um, pro those programs and you get a lot of good information. You, you, learn, you meet other people who have similar, similar interests and experiences and it doesn't cost you the analytic fees. They're also friends of young groups in many cities. There must be a hundred of them in the, in the United States alone. Sure. Uh, there are centers like uh, Riti uh, that Thomas uh, works at in the Black Forest, um, retreats where you can go and spend some time and, and immerse yourself in this. So um, the, the, um, the resources and the uh, opportunities to enter into an individuation process are are quite plentiful um, and, and, and do reading. Uh, you know, there are lots of books that are very helpful in this regard, uh, reading, studying, um, uh, listening to programs like yours, uh, listening to these um, chapters that you're reading online. I think uh, all of that gives a context. Once people start thinking psychologically, thinking, yes, there is an inner world. Yes, there is a spirit of the depths, as Jung writes about, and we can contact that. It's, it's an individual thing. And um, I think if you can make use of a Jungian analyst or someone trained in this area, it's a great thing. It's a great resource. If you can't afford it or you're, you live in an area where it's not possible, you can use some of these other resources. Uh, and that's what we want to try to do to make these available. Uh, worldwide. Um, there are Jungian analysts on every continent now, and uh, it's, it's a growing movement. And the idea is to try to encourage this, uh, what we call individuation on a worldwide level, individuals actually um, making contact with the unconscious, becoming more conscious, um, and in the end, contributing to their own local societies in a, in a more balanced way. How, how would you define an individuation process for someone who's not familiar with the terminology? Well, there, uh, I wrote a book about it. It's called The Principle of Individuation, The Individuation Principle, Principle of Individuation. That's the title. And um, it's, a, it's a, a process of um, growth and development. It starts in the, uh, in the womb and it continues through old age. Jung was a lifespan developmental psychologist. His theory of psychological development in the whole course of life, he called individuation. And it, it proceeds in several stages and steps. Uh, so the first half of life that he talks about involves ego growth. Second half of life involves um, spirituality, coming uh, into closer contact with the unconscious, with the self, with wisdom, um, becoming more philosophical and spiritually minded, symbolic orientation. So there are different phases of, of the individuation process, but in a nutshell, it's a, uh, a process of psychological and spiritual development. And these kinds, of, it, it's similar to um, uh, psychological, well, spiritual development in certain religious traditions where, you know, you have different levels, different stages, you're initiated into uh, uh, different uh, levels of consciousness along the way. Um, and um, these kinds of uh, 
uh, imaginative activities have been used in uh, meditation practices and, and uh, in many traditions over the centuries. So in a sense, it's nothing new, but it's an attempt to come into deeper contact, especially in the second half of life, with oneself, with who one really deeply is, one's inner reality, one's inner world. So uh, usually when we talk about individuation, it's that discovery and elaborating consciousness of the inner world and getting uh, a balance between inner world and outer world um, awareness and um, identities. Our identity in relation to the outer world we call the persona and our identity in relation to the inner world is what we call the ego self connection or the ego self axis. And we try to get a balance between those two. I see. Thomas, did you want to respond? Um, Murray did a perfect explanation. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but let me, add, let me add one thought that Murray mentioned earlier. My feeling is that due to the uh, confusion in the outside world and the political domain, um, Jung is uh, on, on a global level being more um, looked after. There are countless groups that come up, countless books that uh, try to dig into uh, analytical psychology, um, especially America or the, the English-speaking countries are very strong in that. Um, so my feeling is that <clears throat> there's a certain renaissance of Jungian thought. That wasn't the way in the 90s. And we feel that the Red Book itself, since it's, it has been published in 2009, is a, could be a light stern, a guiding light for people of all ages and in all cultures. Just think about the Korean pop group um, that Murray and you are, um, have uh, worked on quite extensively that the Red Book could be the meta-narrative of uh, our time or at least point into the future. That's our feeling and um, it is not completely recognized. As I said, I miss a lot of, let's say, beyond the Jungian journals and the Jungian community, I miss a lot of more attention uh, on the media level worldwide uh, there is no movie about it. Uh, you don't hear in German TV anything about Jung's Red Book. Um, there's not even a name um, mentioned after Carl Jung in Zurich. I mean, that's ridiculous in a certain sense. Mm -hmm. But there's still work to be done. Uh, that's what we're trying to do on our side. And I'm always very glad when I see your lectures, how you pick it up and try to convey it into your audience. Thank you. Um, one of the things that I've been working on of late is especially, and I'll tell you why maybe in a minute, but uh, I've been working on interactions with theologians. And it's, of course, uh, I know that Dr. Young was sensitive about um, poking theologians much during his own lifetime because he was the father of a Swiss re Reformed pastor and the nephew of seven others, I think. And so he didn't push the issue. Uh, but I, fa I found an interesting fact, which is that only of late I've been talking to theologians about the fact that they and psychologists are really in the same business. And that seems quite surprising to them. And I, because of Murray's background as a, a PhD in, in divinity or master of divinity, I, I wonder if you would talk about that. My first uh, published book actually was called Jung's Treatment of Christianity. And uh, that was my, um, based on my a dissertation at the University of Chicago. Uh, Professor Peter Homans was my dissertation advisor and, and uh, teacher 
there, and um, I benefited a lot from his uh, his work on Jung and Freud, and um, and he was he he was very involved in this dialogue between psychology and religion, and actually this department was dedicated at the University of Chicago in the Divinity School to the interface between uh, psychological studies and religious studies. So <clears throat> um, that's where I did my, my doctoral work. And um, Jung, uh, uh, I would say, had a lifelong existential interest in religion. Jung was a religious person. Truly. Uh, he was very sensitive to religious uh, symbols, to religious ritual, to religious ideas, worldwide. He was interested in all the religions of mankind. Um, uh, he, um, however, um, stayed away from what he called metaphysical, um, uh, metaphysical arguments or metaphysical ideas but he would treat them as psychology. He would look at them for their psychological impact, their psychological meaning, and stay away from their truth claims. So um, following Immanuel Kant, the great German philosopher of the early 19th century, who said, you know, our knowledge is limited. It was uh, epistemology. Our knowledge is limited to what we can experience. That's what we have knowledge of. The realm of reality or the level of reality that we cannot experience, he called it the noumenal, as opposed to the phenomenal world, we can only speculate about. We, we don't know, we don't have knowledge about it. We can have beliefs about it, we can have thoughts about it, we can have fantasies about it, but we don't have knowledge. So Jung, as a scientist, scientifically minded, limited himself to what we can know. That is what we can experience, and then we can think about that, and we can make theories about it, and that's psychology. So for Jung, psychology covers a wide range of human experience, including mystical experience, including religious beliefs, including religious images, and, and uh, theological ideas about those images, but he treated all that as psychology. He didn't treat it in a met metaphysical way that the theologians or metaphysicians might do. That said, um, his religious tradition was Christianity. He grew up in it. It was a particular kind of Christianity. Swiss Protestant uh, had its roots in, uh, in um, uh, Ulrich Zwingli's Reformation in Zurich and uh, um, the um, um, uh, Jean Calvin in Geneva, you know, the Swiss are, Switzerland was one of the um, um, hot spots of the Protestant Reformation, Switzerland and Germany, Luther in Germany, Calvin and Zwingli in Switzerland. And uh, Jung grew up in, in that culture, in a culture that was very much formed by Swiss Protestant uh, religious thinking. His grandfather was fluent in Hebrew. He taught it. He was a a famous pastor in, in Basel. He was the chief uh, um, figure in the, at the Basel Cathedral. Jung's father was a Protestant, uh, Swiss Protestant minister. As you said, he had six uncles who were Swiss Protestant ministers. So he was steeped in it. His, his grandchildren told me at one time, he always walked around in a, uh, carrying a small Bible in his jacket pocket. And if he'd have a little extra time, he'd be reading the Bible. So he knew the Bible inside and out. He was, um, and, and one of his last books um, was uh, really a psychological interpretation of the Bible, uh, uh, Answer to Job, uh, where he interprets the whole biblical story in terms of the questions that the book of Job raises. Um, and in my book, uh, Jung's Treatment of Christianity, I took the approach that what Jung did when he took a, a turn in 1938, after he came back from his trip in India, he decided his mission was to offer psychotherapeutic treatment to Western culture. And he gave up his, more or less gave up his Eastern studies. He had been studying and writing about Eastern religions until that point. And he focused on the West. And he wrote some great essays uh, on, the, on the doctrine of the Trinity 
on the, uh, the mass as a transformation process. Uh, the book Ion is about uh, the last 2,000 years of Western history, um, the Christian era, answer to Job in 1952. So in his late years, he took a tremendous interest and a kind of passionate engagement with Christianity. And what he wanted to do was to help it because he felt it was dying. He felt Christianity was losing its um, numinous power to capture the imagination and the hearts of people uh, in the West. And in Switzerland today, hardly anybody goes to church. Uh, I was at lunch today with a, a doctor from Holland and he said in Holland, nobody goes to church. It just right. doesn't grab the people anymore. Right, well that... Great loss. This was, this was not a good thing. Culture needs religion, culture needs spirituality. Sure. And what he we, offered was spirituality to the individual, but not, uh, not in competition with religious traditions. If the religious tradition works for you, he said, it's great. If the symbols speak to you, stay with them. Because religious symbols connect you to the self. They connect you to the archetypal basis of the psyche. And that's what people have had traditionally to connect them to, to their own inner um, uh, spirituality and their own inner value. When you lose that, what do you do? Then you get Modern Man in Search of His Soul. That, that was one of Jung's great books. Modern people and postmodern people no longer have access to the traditions. They can't believe them. They don't speak to them. So what do they do? Then you have a red book. Well, I think I have a diagnosis of this, but let me uh, ask uh, Thomas to comment on this before I <clears throat> opine. Well, he certainly opened up a space for those who are in need of spirituality that they cannot find in the in in the churches or in their uh, in their um, settings they live in anymore. So that's. That's what I think is the big value uh, that holds for all people in the world um, um, to look for their inner church as a, a countermeasure against the disenchantment of the world. Um, I see a lot of activities going on since 20, 30 years of um, <clears throat> people, whether they are in the Jungian community, also physicists, who via quantum theory try to um, search for a re-enchantment of the world. And that's what I think the world needs now. We lost our soul. The world has lost our soul, uh, has lost its soul. And uh, we are in, uh, in, in, in an urgent position um, to, to look for, uh, let's say, the individual soul as well as the world soul itself. And, and, and Jung was the the prophet on this um, when he started to work with Wolfgang Pauli on synchronicity, on the idea of the unity of, of the universe, the unus mundus idea, all this is what he delivered as, let's say, the giant of the 20th century and what we have to pick up and convey and transform into the collective society. Recently, I was watching a video of a Bishop Barron and Jordan Peterson in which they were discussing the quandary of the church. It seems Bishop Barron is a, a Roman Catholic bishop on the West Coast who ha is the chairman of a committee of bishops of the Roman Catholic Church who are trying to bring pa people back into the church and their results are they're losing six Catholics for every one they bring in. And as a businessman, I look at that and I say, my God, if these guys are the marketing team for the Catholic Church, <laughs> maybe we better get a new, a new sales manager. And what was Jordan, what was Jordan Peterson's uh, comment on that or what his position in that discussion? Well, both of them are stuck on the logos, okay? And, of course, Dr. Uh, Dr. Peterson's book, 12 Rules of Life, is all logos all the time. And 
it strikes me, and I, I got this from Dr. Edinger's book, um, The Creation of Consciousness, that um, science is about knowledge and religion is about connection to God, which is uh, Eros. And I think that the place, it seems to me that the place where the church has gone wrong is right in the first 13 verses of the book of John, because the first verse um, says, you know, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And of course, the word is logos. But the problem is that it seems that all Christian faiths, more or less, have moved toward that, toward the logos, which is rationality, and they've moved away from the place where God is. And if you read down to verse 3, or I'm sorry, verse 4, John 1, 4 to 13, you also find out that then came life and the light. And one of the comments that I often make is, okay, we need logos. We need logos 100%. Everything in, my, in this image behind me um, is a product, and we can't produce any product without producing it perfectly. Uh, just ask Boeing. But at the same time, everything in this image was first an image or an, uh, a fantasy of somebody, including the people in the picture, because we were all twinkles in our father's eyes at some point in time. And so that's all fantasy and imagination. And so you can't have anything, any product without having imagination first. And it seems to me that we've lost the meaning of religion. Uh, the Christian church largely has lost the meaning and has lost the access to the arrow side of the psyche, the right brain. Yeah, it's a difficult problem to build the bridge. I've been working on the Jung Pauli dialogue for 20 years, and this is very, very interesting. Um, information those two worked out but you run into the situation that most Jungians don't understand quantum physics and most physicists don't understand the collective unconscious S the same holds for theology in, in Jung somebody would need to carry the Jung Victor White dialogue on I have not seen too much about it. Maybe one author in our series, John Durley, uh, was at home in both worlds. Mm -hmm. But that's the, that's the problem. Uh, how do you build the bridge and, and um, keep the discussion going to create a new worldview? Yeah, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not at home in either world, so therefore I can be an iconoclast and maybe it turns out I start to be the bridge. I don't know. Um, uh, um. Well, I think uh, one thing you said about, um, you know, Jung uh, in the Red Book is challenged uh, a lot uh, on his thinking function, his reliance on thinking and rationality, and he's, um, and he's pressed to give it up. And when he meets Philemon, he wants to know about magic and so on. Philemon says you have to give up your thinking function, and Jung is, is uh, very reluctant to give up thinking. But in the end, he has to do that in order to uh, uh, make contact with uh, uh, other parts of the self, because the thinking, strictly thinking, rational thinking, blocks you and prevents you from making contact. And what he has to develop is a, is a type of ego that is receptive. Uh, you know, Philemon, is the, Philemon and Baucus were the ones who received the gods, Zeus and... Uh, Apollo, who came and knocked at their door, to receive the gods. The ego has to become receptive, which is more feminine than masculine. He has right. to feminize himself. Right. In, in the Red Book, the first two, two paragraphs say exactly that, that That's he had to right. give up his thinking. 
And you see, the church can do that. They, they have the resources to do that, but they've kind of lost their way. The church is supposed to be the receiving, uh, the receptacle of the Holy Spirit. That's what happened on the day of Pentecost. Uh, the apostles received the Holy sure. Spirit. And right. this Pope, Francis, I just read the other day, is the first Pope in history that it takes a positive view of the um, charismatic movement in the church. Hmm. Anything mystical or charismatic was always pushed to the side because it interferes with, with organizational structures. It threatens structures, like the Gnostics threatened uh, the structures of early Christianity. So they're always pushed to the side. But when you push that to the side, you lose the spirit. Right. And a sense of structure. Would and you agree that the Gnostics Francis, were? Would you agree that the Gnostics are seventeen hundred years ahead of their time? <laughs> they're, yeah, I think they're um, perennial. They're always good. <laughs> but it's the attitude, you know, it's that attitude of being open to uh, whatever comes. And that's the key to the Red Book and the key to active imagination, that you are open to what comes to you as an individual. And show them your Red Book, Thomas. Uh, Thomas said everyone should make their own red book. That doesn't mean to imitate Jung and, and create, uh, you know, Jung, uh, repeat what Jung said right in your red book. But Thomas has a friend who is producing these huge, beautiful volumes. Oh, that? wow. Tremendous. That's a red book made in Germany by hand, uh, empty pages, leather cover. And you can buy these things. Uh, uh, on their, uh, they're for sale. One, they make them one at a time. Um, and so you can take your active imaginations and paint in there and do like Jung did. But it will be your own. Where, where, where do we get one, Thomas? And how much do they cost? I, I can, it's a friend of mine who produces this, this blank red book. Uh, which is an exact facsimile, facsimile copy, I can send you uh, uh, a movie, uh, how it is produced. And if you want to have one, uh, we can send it to you. I might want to, although my, as one of my followers said, uh, I'm creating my red book online. <laughs> Online, yeah. It's a uh, right. postmodern version. <laughs> right. So, um, Marian Thomas, this brings up uh, the issue of mysticism and how uh, Dr. Jung has been dissed by uh, many over the last century because they say he's a mystic. And um, so, in your in your series, I, I know there's. Um, at least one essay that focuses on astrology, and uh, that's by Liz Green, I believe. And so I wonder if you would address that. It, it so happens that I'm a fairly good master of the tarot, um, but I understand the tarot as relying primarily on synchronicity and hooks that are in people's <clears throat> psyche. So I understand the, I think I understand the psychological mechanism of the Tarot, which leads me to sometimes say that I could go into an auditorium with a thousand people in it, throw the Tarot cards across the stage and do a reading without any particular layout. And everyone in the room would think I'd done a reading for them. Of course, I would not know what the reading is for them and every, everyone would be responding differently. So I wonder if you would care to comment on that assertion. Well, what's so bad about to be a mystic? So I don't see, uh, I don't see the issue. <laughs> well, um, the problem is that, that many people have dissed Dr. Jung as a mystic. In fact, there's a book called Jung the Mystic, and it makes it seem dirty or something and yeah. from the, from an Ameri from american puritan or or calvinistic point of view that sounds bad i don't know well i think part of him is a mystic part of him is a prophet 
uh, I completely follow uh, Peter Kingsley's uh, view on Jung in Katafalk. Um, <clears throat> so I don't have an issue with that. With respect to astrology, um, I would agree with you that it is based on on the same principle like uh, the I Ching and the uh, Tarot, uh, based on synchronicity. I work with it since uh, 30 years with the I Ching and with astrology. I recently read a, a nice statement by Terence McKenna about the I Ching. The I Ching is not magic, it's only science that we don't understand. Um, it's very powerful, everybody knows that, who works with it. It is as powerful as the tarot cards, and astrology is also very powerful if you know the mechanism behind it, and the, the limitations naturally too. I think of mysticism um, in a, quite a different way. I don't think um, uh, you know astrologers are mystics. I think they, it's a different kind of science, as Thomas said. Um, a mystic is a person who has a direct uh, experience of an archetype or an archetypal image. And they either fuse with it or they become very uh, entangled with it. And it takes them out of their ordinary state of consciousness into another like a kind of spiritual, you could say, spiritual men, uh, mental state or a feeling of uh, oneness uh, with the God figure or um, Eric Neumann wrote a wonderful essay called Mystical Man. Uh, 1949, he gave it at the Aranos Conference, and he said, uh, everybody is potentially a mystic um, because we're we are all uh, at the bottom of our psyches uh, in the collective unconscious. The archetypes um, are, are present. It's a question, can you connect to them? If you connect to an archetype, you have a mystical experience. Mm -hmm. So people right. who can archetypes and archetypal images mm -hmm. uh, have what quotes are mystical experiences. These are exalted states. These are very special states, exceptional states of consciousness, often accompanied with synchronicities. And um, they, um, they, they, uh, they, they give you a, a feeling of the transcendent. They, they produce a, a knowledge. That's what Gnosticism is based on. Uh, the experience of the transcendent, a mystical experience, gives you knowledge. Do you think they're usually, are, are they usually triggered by trauma? I mean, I, I've been reading Dr. Donald Kalshin's book, um, Trauma and the Soul. They're not triggered by, uh, by trauma. The trauma may, traumatic, traumatized people may have mystical experiences. In fact, they may be more open to them because they've been know they have a kind of access to the uh, to the unconscious that non-traumatized people might not have but um, the myst the traumatic experience doesn't trigger mystical experience you can have mystical experiences uh, in, uh, in very non-traumatic uh, uh, environments like a monastery or you know a cloister uh, the great mystics uh, have a special connection to the transcendent and they speak about it, they write about it, and they are, they contribute to um, religious awareness and they contribute to philosophy. Philosophers uh, have often um, drawn inspiration from, uh, from mystics. Mystics write in a slightly different way, but then philosophers rationalize it and make uh, philosophical principles out of mystics. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's well, I, I, I've yeah. had quite a number of such experiences, but I'll yeah. just uh, share one that is that is negative and uh, just get your comments on it. Twenty years ago, my daughter had gone to Russia to be a fellow for the U.S. Information Service for a year and a half, and she fell in with uh, Christian uh, missionaries who were of fundamentalists, of course. And when she came back on her 22nd birthday, I took her out to dinner at a lovely Afghan restaurant we here have here in the Washington area. And I had been all over the world with her. She grew up part of her life in Japan with me. We traveled literally around the world one time in 1984 together. 
And uh, so we had this lovely dinner, just the two of us. And at the end of the evening, just as we were leaving and I was getting into my car to come back to Annapolis, she said, Dad, I'm sorry to say this to you, but I think you're going to hell, quote unquote. And I said, said to myself, who teaches a child to say such a thing to a parent? And then on my drive home uh, from Washington, uh, I was about halfway across on Route 50, and suddenly I was visited by a vision of Mephistopheles. He literally plopped down in the seat next to me. And um, the only thing I could think of was to cut the Faustian bargain. And the bargain I made was that he could have my immortal soul on my death, provided none of my daughters thought that of me for the rest of my life. And he disappeared. And he hasn't come back. And it occurred to me that, uh, and the Mephistopheles that came to me was the Mephistopheles that I had envisioned when I read Faustus. And so... Um, has he kept his bargain? Yeah, he, so far, yes. And okay, so it wasn't my relationship with the, my daughters has been uh, quite reliable. Why do you say it's negative? It sounds positive to me. It well, it was, it was certainly frightening at the time. And, and uh, I've been criticized by some of my followers for giving, giving up my immortal soul so, so cheaply. <laughs> <laughs> but but I but I say wow man. <laughs> I, think you made a good, I think you made a very good bargain. That wasn't cheap. Look what you got from it. Right. Uh, and who knows what will happen to your immortal soul? Faust didn't go to hell. No, yeah, of course uh, not. You won't go to hell. No, I, I never thought that either. No, and for, but fortunately, I knew something about Jungian psychology by then. So. I, you know, I knew that I was having a vision that was uh, archetypal vision, but it occurred to me that yeah. this is how the church often scares people into coming into the church because they yeah. describe the devil, and and I'm sure a lot of people in medieval times, especially, but even today, I suppose, have experiences like that. Yes, yeah, but you handled it very well, thanks to your. Jungian knowledge, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks to that, that's for sure, because because traveling at 65 miles an hour, you don't mess around with the devil. <laughs> um, sorry. Yeah, Skip, Skip, let me add one, one thought I had about your question of uh, Jung and astrology. Only recently, <clears throat> Uh, the public gets to know that Jung was deeply involved in astrology. Uh, Liz Green published two books on it, as well as Chiron Le Gris, who's also an author of our series. And I was amazed how, how deep Jung was um, <clears throat> immersed in astrology as much as in alchemy. He, he did charts of his own. He would use astrology for his clients within the therapeutical setting. Um, and this has only come up since a year or two. Right. And it so happens that I have right here the first page of the red book. I'm adding the, the first page, which has the scene with the sailboat and, mm -hmm. and the astrological symbols. And I'm sure both of you know this, this image. So uh, do you have any comments on that. Well, the first image is Jung setting out on his journey. Right. You know, the Red Book is a construction. It isn't just uh, the uh, raw data from his active imagination. It's a, it's a heavily edited, reworked uh, uh, manuscript that he uh, placed into his precious Red Book. Um, so uh, uh, when he when he created that picture in that first page, he knew already where he had, where he was going because uh, that came in like 1915. Uh, the, the bulk of the Red Book material uh, in the Black Books um, took place between, there it is, yeah. Yep, there it is. Yeah. Uh, so he painted that after the event. And, and that uh, obviously that's an astrological 
reference see, across the top. The stars, you see the astrological symbols at the top, yeah, exactly. And it shows that he was already in those years aware that, let's say, mankind is on a journey between two ages. And that's basically our model um, to understand where we are now with respect to the spirits of our time in a kind of interim between an age that is dying since 200 years and an age that is coming, Aquarius, and we're still not yet clear what the new God image will be. Right. I think, Mary, you're, when you wrote um, Jung's Map of the Soul, which I got sent back to thanks to the work of BTS, um, I have listened to it a couple of times on Audible, but when BTS came out with their new album, I was drawn back to that book. And what I found very interesting in that book was your discussion about the stages of consciousness and the fact that stage three was a, is a stage in which we're projecting um, the, the self or the God image out on on either religious figures or on isms. And then the fourth stage became uh, the 20th century when God was dead thanks to Nietzsche, or not thanks to Nietzsche, but Nietzsche had observed it at the end of the 19th century. And then the fifth stage, if I understand you correctly, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that the stage of actually having an experience of God. Yeah. And, and yeah, discovering, uh, uh, you know, that uh, what was originally thought of as, um, you know, religious nonsense, or what was thought of in, in, in modernity as religious nonsense and superstition, all the fairy tales, all the miracles, all that, uh, totally dismissed by Feuerbach and, and, uh, and the 19th century philosophers, uh, Marx, um, they, uh, Jung said, uh, but there was something there, wasn't there? So what was it? So it's a, a, um, a, 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 a reappreciation of what was experienced in the religious age, but now on a symbolic and inner level. And you could say that's what he does in the Red Book, because in the Red Book, he's experiencing age-old symbols from a religious past. He's not experiencing his mother and father and grandfather, nothing personal in there. These are all uh, significant figures from the religious past, but he's experiencing them in a powerful inner personal way. So it's like reacquiring the religious values, but in a new way. And right. That, well, uh, reenchanting the world, as uh, Thomas was talking about. That's why we think uh, the Red Book belongs onto that uh, chain of pearls um, of important scriptures of mankind, the, the golden chain, the Aurea Catena. Right. Yeah, I, I quip sometimes that Carl Jung discovered the living God, where he lives, and how he goes about doing the business of the Godhead. And uh, in that spirit, um, I'm toying with the idea of giving a talk in a, in a sanctuary uh, that I rent for the occasion um, where, and the, the, talk, the name of the talk would be Finding the Living God. And uh, so, yes. I, I was wondering if you had comments about that. <clears throat> You're not dissuading me, Murray. <laughs> Finding the living God as an inner experience. I mean, that, that is the, the, the Gnostic and uh, really the Jungian approach, but it's based on individual experience and uh, it may be different from your neighbors, you know? Um, oh, absolutely. No. I mean, I, I, I've, I've had many. So one day I was uh, desperately hurting. Uh, because of something that was happening in my life. Fortunately, it wasn't my life and it wasn't my wife, but I went into the chapel at the U.S. Naval Academy 
and it was quite <clears throat> dark in the chapel. I normally do this in the morning when no one is around, and so there weren't any lights on, only lights through the stained glass windows. And the stained glass window in this picture is actually done by Tiffany, and so you can see the quality of it as compared to the three across the bottom, which are not Tiffany. And uh, as I was sitting there and sort of in, in an attitude of prayer, uh, suddenly I was bathed in light. And this is a chapel that seats 2,000 people, but it was only where I was seated that was lit at that moment. And it just completely changed my attitude. I mean, I really saw it as a religious experience. I thought to myself, oh my God, nobody will ever believe me if I, if I try to describe this. So I'm, I'm going to have to take a photo of it. So I pulled my iPhone out and I took a picture of it. I mean, I caught, I've caught a couple of others actually on video, but this is what I had. And so you can see how dark it is in the building. Yeah. And I just... I took the first picture that I just showed you and then I flipped it around and, and took this picture because I just uh, was so astounded by this experience. And you can see that my attitude about life had, by, in that instant, in that 10 second period, had just entirely changed because I was quite depressed when I went into the chapel and I was sort of sitting there in this attitude of prayer and then suddenly this light came on me in this way and of course it wouldn't necessarily happen the same way to anyone else and obviously you can say it's a coincidence it's you certainly very special experiences skip from light yeah. to dark and back huh? oh yes many i many i i have them all the time actually it's it's almost every day Jung called these hints. Numinous experiences are hints of the transcendent. He wouldn't give them metaphysical standing. Metaphysical standing means they belong to being, and there's an assertion of reality about them. But he says they're hints of the transcendent, and that's the way he held his own experiences, too. I think it's a good way to hold these kind of experiences. They're hints of something beyond, and they yes. give us assurance and uh, some knowledge. Of course, and understanding, you know, the experiences of the ancients. I mean, these images, just like the two I just showed you, or the first one I just showed you, are very common, and especially movies in the 50s and 60s and 70s. I saw a number of films that had a scene very much like that. Um, in the Bible, <clears throat> people bathed in light suddenly, and angels appearing. And surely. These are age-old experiences. <clears throat> yeah. Well, th gentlemen, I thank you very much for an uh, interesting conversation. I think it's been very useful. I, do you have any final thoughts, Thomas, before we wrap this up? I, I know Murray has some things to do. So, Well, thank you first for uh, all the work uh, to promote our project. Um, we, we keep on moving. As Marie said, we're working on volume four. Um, volume five is already set up and is connected to a rather big conference that we're planning right now at the Lago Maggiore uh, at the Eranos, the famous Eranos Foundation, next April. And uh, yeah, maybe we'll have a sixth volume. It has taken quite a direction that we did not expect in the, uh, in the beginning. Um, <clears throat> the Red Book cannot be exhausted, so uh, due to its complexity and its, uh, let's say, even metaphysical size, and it is a light stand, that's our feeling, a guiding light for our times now, and we would like to thank you for your help and your work to promote that idea. Thank you, Thomas. I'm delighted to hear it. I, uh, for me, it's been a profound experience to read these essays, and I really appreciate them. And as you know, um, from 
from the uh, outtakes that I've left on a few of these, I, I've been touched very deeply by many of these essays. And uh, the one I published yesterday, Stephen Eisenstadt's essay is uh, one of those. And <laughs> sometimes the outtakes are, can be comical, but sometimes you see where he's touched me very deeply. So thank you for everything. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Murray, you, you had a had a closing comment? I would, just, uh, I would second everything that, uh, that Thomas said. And uh, I think you're reaching people, you know, that, uh, that we wouldn't be able to reach otherwise. And uh, we really appreciate your work. Um, also with BTS, I think um, BTS is reaching uh, huge numbers of people at least with some terms and some uh, concepts that I hope will help uh, the next generation uh, to um, do a better job than maybe our generations have done in making the world a habitable place and a saner place. Um, but um, thank you for all your work and, and uh, keep on going. Well, um I, I'm certainly impressed by what BTS has done. Obviously, I wore my BTS colored shirt today, especially to honor <laughs> honor their work because uh, I'm just incredibly impressed by these young yeah. men and what they've done. And uh, it's beyond phenomenal. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, thank you very much, gentlemen. Okay. I'll, I'll close the meeting at this point and uh, be happy to speak with you again at some other time. Thank, thank you. you. Take thank care you. now. N nice Good. seeing you in person. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Some very nice books over here I showed with there, Skip. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it wouldn't hurt to have those plus this one in my hand. Yeah. Okay. There's more, more to come. <laughs> yes. I'm not going to read the, your extensive books, Murray, but people will be familiar with them, I think, by now. Ja, hallo, herzlich willkommen. Wir haben heute eine kleine Premiere. Wir waren etwas mutig auf der CG Jung.com, um für Sie ein ganz besonderes Produkt heute vorzustellen. Es befindet sich hier in dieser Kassette. Ich kann Ihnen einmal kurz präsentieren, um was es sich handelt. Sie werden es wahrscheinlich schon vermuten. Es ist ein Buch. Und dieses Buch werden Sie unschwer erkennen, denn es handelt sich um das rote Buch von CG Jung. Natürlich nicht das Original aber eine doch sehr gelungene Reproduktion. Dieses Buch ist so, wie das Original auch von den Maßen her konzipiert und wir haben es geschafft, ein Buch mit leeren Seiten zu produzieren. Das ist kein Zufall, sondern wir möchten gerne, dass der Leser dieses Buches, der natürlich kein Leser ist, sondern ein Schreiber, der soll in dieses Buch seine Konfrontation mit dem Unbewussten aufschreiben. Und diese Idee war geboren äh, in dem Moment, wo ich daran dachte, dass Jung ja auch dazu aufgerufen hat, jeder möge sein eigenes rotes Buch schreiben. Und zu diesem Buch gehört dieser Filz, die Kassette und noch weitere sechs schwarze Notizbücher. Und das Ganze nennt sich Principium Individuationis. Ich kann es jetzt mal wieder einpacken, sodass Sie im Grunde genommen sehen, wie hervorragend dieses Buch produziert wurde und wie hervorragend es aufbewahrt wird. Zu diesem Buch werden wir an dieser Stelle einige weitere Informationen an Sie veröffentlichen. 
in bestimmten Abständen und ich freue mich schon darauf, wenn es weitergeht, Teil 2, das rote Buch und sein Inhalt. Vielen Dank.